um, Brendan to join us. I, I, of course, I'll welcome everybody. I and thank you for reading your emails. That makes me feel pretty good. Hey, Brendan, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, your day going pretty good? Yeah, there's nothing going on in uptown. Just a regular day. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have an announcement to make like the strike is over? No, but I have a fascinating one to make is that like halfway through the morning, they called Robin and Jenna and said, Nisna usually never talks about when they, when they talk about um, uh, ratios, they, you know, even if they're not really talking about ratios or if we're not going to accept ratios, they never talk about the emergency department. And they um, asked them to come into the negotiation room and have a conversation about what yeah. should be done for emergency medicine. And just like, I mean, the primer here for people who don't think about this is that if you create a, a fixed ratio upstairs, it means in general, because you can never get it exactly perfect, that, um, that you know, the patients pile up in the emergency department because you're not allowed to violate the ratio upstairs. If you then create a ratio in the emergency department, when people surge in, they just pile up in the waiting room, you know, and you've sort of seen plenty of press reports about, you know, 100 people in a waiting room in LA and people dying in the waiting room because it's not the responsibility of those people to take care of them because it violates their, their ratios. So uh, I don't know what's happening in that room, but it's interesting that they're saying for the first time, okay, what do we do about <coughs> staffing challenges in emergency departments? Because of course we all know the real. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's not to be dramatic, but seriously, it, it is historic uh, for us here uh, in New York. And uh, it's never been a topic anyone has wanted to address. My uh, first annual report uh, in 2009 uh, I had a section on staffing and staffing ratios. And uh, I used the Illinois models and the California models. And, and I even used uh, uh, the Emergency Nurses Association has a white paper uh, on staffing and proper staffing uh, ratios. And um, I put it in my report and I had a meeting with senior leadership. And basically it was kind of torn up in front of me and said, uh, this, this isn't something that we want to discuss. And all, all my point is with a little bit of patience and a little bit of perseverance and a big old strike, uh, sometimes the ball gets moved forward a little bit. We'll, we'll see. It's at least an important discussion to be taking place. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the people in the room understand emergency medicine well enough to understand that, you know, you just got to be really careful because like none of us, none of us, want people piled up in the waiting rooms that have never seen a, a medical person, you know, like that's just, it just feels irresponsible. You know, our literature has a fair amount of rich material on staffing, physician staffing, PA staffing, and nursing staffing. And uh, for the residency leadership, if Duncan's still on, you know, that might be an interesting topic uh, or an interesting grand rounds to just look at how calculations get made and uh, some of the successes and failures of trying to implement uh, the, those ratios. So it's a good topic from an operations point of view. So anyway, uh, today uh, we have lots of great topics to talk about, uh, but we'll try and be vectored because I know it's been a long day for everyone. Uh, this is the first uh, faculty development session of, uh, of the uh, academic year. Uh, we didn't do anything through the fall, and I apologize for that, but we mapped out I think a really nice series for the next 12 months. And I'm always uh, uh, open for people's suggestions. We, we want to engage uh, all of us who are involved in, in our careers and live in the academic world and also in the community world. And so uh, there's so many things to discuss. The institution, Mount Sinai, has a faculty development series also. And it's a little bit more general in its approach. And our faculty development, we're always trying to gear a little bit, a little bit of our practice to, to emergency medicine. And so today, actually, uh, we've asked Brendan, and I don't know if Eric Legome has joined us also, but we wanted to have a little bit of discussion on how we measure performance, because whether we like it or not, uh, our performance metrics are what drives compensation, but it also drives career development. And it's not so easy. It's not as easy as you think, but this is a very important topic, especially for Brendan, because Brendan once a year 
meets with the dean and the dean wants a spreadsheet and he wants to look at the budget. And in his spreadsheet, he wants every faculty listed and that spreadsheet needs to show how much money the faculty member brings in and how much money is the faculty member getting paid. And Brendan has fixed money that you make by uh, doing clinical work and getting grants and everything. And then Brendan has a pot of gold that has, it doesn't have a bottom to it. And he can keep reaching into to balance the individual faculties. It's called the Jagoda Fund. We call that the yeah. Jagoda Philanthropic Fund. So in, in, in the history of our specialty in academics, this was easy because in the end of the day, after they made you cry, they would just write a check and balance the budget. But those days are a little over. So as each of you meet with, whether it's Yvette or Deb or Ugo or Brendan or whoever you're meeting with at the end of the year, basically performance is looked at. And you're going to ask Brendan for two things. You want more money and less clinical time. And Brendan's going to look to you and say, why? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and then you have the discussion and it's a fun discussion. So anyway, uh, I, I could go on and on, but this isn't my session, it's, it's, it's Brendan's. So I thought we'd at least uh, ask him to talk a little bit about the things that goes through his head as he puts budgets together and as he looks to each individual faculty, what does he want from you? And, uh, and, and how do we deliver it uh, to be financially responsible? Because in the end, we all have to be financially responsible. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the timing is good because a lot of folks just had, and people that are Sinai based just had their end of year, most of you, there's like whatever, half a dozen that slipped through the cracks, half end of year conversation. And and we have not had a, you know, the last couple of years have been nothing but chaos. We've not had a lot of clear metrics around what, how things were going to be based. And like the good news, bad news is that um, those uncomfortable conversations with the dean had so much, um, so many ridiculous um pieces that were part of them that um that that it was easy to hide from clarity um and i guess the good news is that um, there's now a massive strike and mount sinai hospital's budget is upside down again so maybe i'll hide one more time but the first year you right COVID happened we lost remember we were projected to be 10 million dollars short um and we ended up like three or four so they thought we were superheroes because we closed a lot of the gap um last year there was um last year we essentially came in even but we cheated to do it um through a couple different mechanisms that aren't interesting or important we have made and andy this has changed um over the last year we have made a, a really compelling argument we went to anesthesia that does not so what andy was talking about was a business plan anytime we wanted to hire a new faculty member they wanted a business plan for us and we have spent countless hours explaining to them that we are, are not surgeons right we don't go out and get cases and generate revenue and sort of use that revenue that we generate to pay our salaries. We are a, a facility-based um, requirement that must exist and there is a market out there. And so showing them comps for what doctors um, make, comps for how many patients we can see per hour and um, putting together a compensation plan and then showing them what the revenue on that is, um, it allows us to, until we screw up, to hire to volume and to revenue rather than build uh, um, a business plan for each individual doctor, which is what Andy had to do for all those years because they didn't, they just didn't understand the business. It was very helpful. Anesthesia was really helpful in this space where we went, we, we sort of had, because that's what they do for anesthesia. Anesthesia says like, listen, you gotta have, this is how many ORs we have. This is how many doctors and how many nurse anesthetists it, call, it takes to staff these operating rooms. And, uh, you know, and you want us to be, but you can't like, can you imagine, right? Like if there were cases that wanted to go and you didn't have an anesthesiologist, right? That's not gonna work because that's how we generate revenue. Anyway, so we use their thinking and, 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 they, and they, let us, they, let, they let us move to a new model, which is to say, um, you know, sort of not, not an individual business thing, but a business model for each doctor, but a staffing model. That is, I think, piece one. And then piece two is, you know, and this is, I think, clear to most of you, but you know, when, when you generate a bill for the for a patient, there's a professional side and there's a facility side. So if I'm team health and I'm bidding on a community um, contract, I go and I say to them, we'll take our pro side uh, fees plus a stipend of X 
from the from you from the hospital which collects the facility side that's that's you know that's how they get structured and that x factor is um is you know is where all well a couple things your negotiated rate and your payer mix obviously are a huge piece how you bill how aggressively you bill how much critical care time how many procedures you bill for all that stuff is a huge piece but the facility side is a huge piece too and if you get a facility if you've got a everybody 100 percent privately insured population at valley hospital in new jersey right i'm sure there's some medicare but there's not a lot of medicaid and there's not a lot of there's not a lot of any uninsured folks you know that ends up being um, a much easier business case to make. So that's that that sort of is one complication is that we have a mission to take care of everybody and they don't have that in some of the practices that don't see uninsured folks. So our business model looks terrible. You know when you compare what we bring in, given that we'll see everybody relative to what they'll bring in in a place that only sees people that are insured. Um, you know, our business model looks bad. But most of that has gone by the wayside, and it sort of is I think not the sort of the thrust of this conversation. I, I think. You know, underlying finance is always underlying, and we have to explain why people are eligible for the salary that they're eligible for, and for the incentive, the performance-based incentive at the end of the year that they're eligible for. Um, but it, and if it were as simple as we're team health, it would be simpler. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen these these dashboards and metrics that they have. Um, they're they're they you know the one I know the most and have seen the most but can't share is. Um, USACS, US Acute Care Solutions, you guys know this group, um, you know, they are massive and they know everything, everything. They know like, you know, how many head CTs, how many abdominal CTs, if you're like the PE master and you get a chest CT on everybody, they know your patients per hour, they know, um, they know, I mean, they know, they know, they know, they know if you're cherry picking charts and grabbing ones that you can move quickly. You know, they know the ratio of how many, so when, you know, when we, we'll get into some details, but when we, when we look at our faculty, uh, and I'm going to mostly talk in the weeds here, I'll mostly talk about MSH because it's the data that I know the most. We look at our critical care faculty, right? And, the, and we look at sort of their, their patients per hour and their RVUs, um, it's, um, and, and, and other metrics versus somebody who spends most of their time in express care. You know, where, you know, one place you see few patients, but you bill a lot. And uh, the other place you see a lot of patients, but you bill a less, right? So, you know, like the, 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 you, these things are all knowable, right? It's just math to, to know these things. You can go deep, 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 deep crazy around this stuff. Um, but there's a second mission that we have, and this is why it's a little tricky to be us, and because we are this, we are an enterprise that has community hospitals and has academic hospitals. Um, and we have other sources of revenue, right? So let's for a minute talk about time and effort and uh, grids because you maybe you've heard me talk about them, maybe you've not. Many, you know, this is a mixed bag on the call. Some of you, um, your whole life is clinical. Some of you get a, a little bit of um, a little bit of money from the School of Medicine to do things. Some of you write grants to the outside world uh, to, to do things. Some of those grants pay a portion, pay your time based on your whole salary versus a portion of your salary. I mean, it is uh, the different way. Let's, let's keep going. So, you know, we struck this deal maybe two years ago with the utilization review folks so that we can have people look at charts, argue with insurance companies and try to overturn claims to get us paid for things that we did. We lease you at cost to uh, the Indian Health Service. Um, you know, like, what else we got? I We lease we lease some of you. You know, Andy does um, corporate advisory work. He's like a CMO for a consulting firm, essentially. Um, and when he goes and tells in whoever, Time Warner, I'm making it up. I don't know, you know what your accounts are. Um, this is this is how you should return people to work. This is how you should manage COVID sick out time. This is what you do for vaccines. Here's what you do for the flu. How do I make people? What's my arrival curve of like patient of people so that they can avoid crowded subways and not contaminate each other in the elevators? Who the heck knows what they're asking him? They're asking him all manner of questions. Um, what when do I open up and go back to Bangalore? You know, and to Dubai and to. New Delhi, you know, like these sort of giant corporate entities, some of whom have high rates, you know, what are they asking you about China right now, right? I mean, it must be crazy right now. Anyway, we sell you because you're super smart and versatile to a million different people. But what that means on the back end is that for each of you, there's like an Excel spreadsheet that tells us um, what, what, what we're getting. So, you know, there's all these conversations around, around, um, 
there's all these conversations around what that time is costs and how that translates into the conversation most people want to have with me and I mostly want to have with nobody, which is how that translates into their clinical effort. The conversation I always want to have is a totally different one, right? And half of you want to have that conversation, which is in 30 years, like when you look back, what career did you carve for yourself? What do you want to do? Like, who do you want to become? Like, what do you want your your Wikipedia page and your and your grandkids to say about you? And that's hard because some of you say, I wanted to say that I was home as much as possible and that I paid the bills, right? In which case, then we're right back into the conversation about like, okay, so what's your salary and what's your bonus potential and how do you earn that bonus and, and what's your, and what's your, uh, uh, and what's your clinical effort? But many of you, since mostly, again, this gets distributed, those conversations are happening more in the community hospitals than at the academic medical center. Most of you, many of you at the academic medical centers are sort of saying, I do want something special out of my career and my life and my Wikipedia page and my grandkids and my, and my, what's it called when we die? Memorial? That's not what it's called. What's it called? Obituary. No, nah, yeah, but when they come all together and say nice things, whatever it is. Eulogy. Eulogy, that's the word. Yeah, my dad's an undertaker. Do you guys know that? I grew up in a funeral home, dug graves my entire childhood to pay the bills. Um, so after eulogy, right? Like you might, you know, you might want them to say things. So those are the fun conversations for me to have. I, you guys all know, um, some of you don't, I guess. I'm looking just Joel because you're sitting there, right? And, so, yeah, and, and Fred, right? People that ha aren't yet, you know, sort of looking at faculty grids. I can, I can share some, I can share some screen. Maybe you guys have seen this, maybe you haven't. And those of you who just had recent meetings with me at the end of the year, we sort of walked through some of the structure of what this is going to look like. But a lot of you have seen this thing. Right. I mean, this is, you know, this is Pedro, this is Metali, this is Andy before I got here. It's changed a little bit. Right. But like, I, I don't have anybody highlighted over here because I didn't want to embarrass anybody. I can embarrass myself about chart completion. If we're being really honest, I have a I have a problem here. I should see somebody about my problem with chart completion because I work Tuesday evenings and I clean up my inbox on like Fridays and Saturdays and then it's past 72 and I've missed a bunch. Um, but, the, you know, this is the clinical side of your life. Uh, I don't know, you know, if, if Elaine, Brett, um, Clay are here, but I desperately want a sec an, an additional one of these, and we'll have one soon, that shows me the other side of your life, the academic side of your life. Because it's one thing, so, you know, we can break this down, and you guys have all seen this, you know, what are your transfer orders, what are your press gaming scores, you know, and you, and, and you can, you, see, you, you guys get the dashboard that doesn't have people identified, but, you know, I can click on any of you here and see <coughs> where you are. What are your RVUs per hour? Why is this person so crazy over here with that number, right? When do you close your charts? What's your average? This is So this is, again, back to the critical care folks. So the critical care folks, if they work predominantly in our recess area, their average ENMs are high. You know, their patients per hour are low. And where does that land their translation thing here about their RVUs? Um, it, you know, it, it, it lands it, the, the good news is it lands it sort of in the middle. You know, this is, this is not such dramatic variation. We know what this cluster is here, you know, much love to the PEM people, the, the PEM people generate less revenue, right? This, these are, these are the PEMers folks down here. And when we do, when we tether this to bonus, we'll pull them out. Um, most people aren't outliers on patients per hour because most of our operations, uh, at least uptown is dependent on the provider and triage and the nurses pushing patients into your zone and you being responsible for them. And then a culture that says you can't just walk away at the end of your shift with all these unseen patients. So, you know, so that we, that, that drives uh, a, a lot of, a lot of, um, it, that drives a relatively flat curve here. Um, and then, you know, this, some of these other things, documenting, documenting the sepsis uh, requirements and stuff like that, that's going to happen. We, we, you know, we used to use a lot of time to um, provider and time to disposition based on what, um, where people were, you see the time to provider is gone because you know the provider and triage has sort of stopped that. Uh, the time to dispose still matters, but mm, for the treat and releases, I guess this matters. Um, but it's pretty variable based on what shift you work, which is why it's not tethered to bonuses. So we could go deep on this, but that you know the clinical side is the clinical side. We don't have cross-sectional imaging utilization in there. We didn't, I mean, you know, we should, we can talk about all these things. We have talked about all these things and what we want to have because it's very easy to pull it out of Epic. Would we like to know, like, you know, who are the heavy utilizers of abdominal CTs and who aren't, right? Would it then create a battle about, well, but, but, but my patients are, 
but I always work acute too. And that's where all the patients need abdominal CTs. And Andy would say, yeah, see, I don't do a lot of abdominal CTs. And, you know, and somebody would say, but that's not fair. It's because, you know, he mostly works in, uh, in express care or in, or in our lower acuity zone. Uh, you know, the overnight people have, have challenges in their sort of patients per hour, because at some point, most nights, uh, the chaos slows down, the six train stops running, and, uh, and they don't just come pouring in 40 every 12 minutes, you know, when the six train stops. So let's pause for a second and talk about the clinical side of things. We, we, can, we can measure anything we want. The question is, in my mind, the question is, what is the culture that we're trying to drive? And if I want to be in your face about like your abdominal CAT scans, sure, like we can pull those data. It's not the culture that I, I that, that any of the leads and any of the sites really want. The things for next year, and we can talk about what is on the performance basin center for next year. And this uh, is rolling out, I imagine, to each of your shops. Um, but it is. Well, let, let me let me let me sort of pause for two seconds and say, are the questions about where things are? Yeah, Brendan, I have a question. Yeah. So in terms of these clinical metrics, how are they used differently here than they might be if you worked for one of the large groups? I mean, here it seems like they're only being used for your performance bonus and nothing else. Is that any different than the way they're being used in like if you're, if you're slow, do they manage you out? Sure. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that they, I mean, not so many words, you know, but I think that like you get sort of started talking to you get coached, right? I mean, USACS has a lot of people that will sort of give you metrics on or uh, give, give you tips on how to, how to move faster, how to document better. I mean, there's a lot, there's, their business is much less about um, the other things that we do, you know, the, the, the training folks and the academic work and, national recognition and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's much more about if they just sort of bump that incentive, uh, bump that reimbursement just a little bit, you know, a little bit across a lot of people, it turns out to be a lot of money, right? So it's, it's well worth sort of getting somebody in there to sort of help you to understand. But, you know, I'll tell you another piece that's interesting is um, the way we do, interesting to me, the way we do denials here is interesting, you know, like we wait until it's going to get denied and then we pay for doctor time and case management time to put a little dossier together so that we can sort of, you know, push back on them. A decade ago, most of the country, for those who've been here the whole time, sort of pivoted to a, play, a place where you have an embedded case manager in the emergency department. And before you put a patient in OBS or in the emergency department, you put a little like marker on that thing. And someone leans over and says, what do you want to do? OBS or inpatient? And say, I, they, they, just need, they need to my, like, they need to be in state. They need to be inpatient. All my my all my like you know doctorally skills say that's that's the right thing that's what they need to do and um uh the case manager says okay uh give me a minute they look at the chart they look at the documentation they cross it, uh, reference it with like mckesson or interqual or whatever criteria you're getting used and they say they're not going to meet it i got what you're trying to do here based on your note um but like you know and, and my, here's my sense the good ones right they sum it up in, in minutes here's my sense like they're kind of old lady dehydrated, you know, you're not sure that they can take care of their ADLs. You know, we back in the day used to call this a social admit, but I'm noticing their creatinine has increased more than X. And did you know that the threshold is X to have it not be disqualified for an admission? Or, you know, yeah, I see that you didn't walk them. Do you know if they desat when you walk them? Or, right, and they'll give you like three or four different, and they, they're literally coming to you with a book. And like, they've got like four different sections that say like, here's the admission criteria, right? And you can, and they, they, it's like, uh, you know, they, they, they just sort of help to coach you to what the test is going to be. We can't get there at Sinai for lots of reasons that are not interesting, but very cultural just yet. We are pushing super hard because uh, it's where we need to be. The way that we do it now is, is inefficient. What they like to do is to review it and then send us a report, you know, quarterly that says, you guys are bad at documenting for sepsis, why they're being admitted. And we're like, you know, like that, that does, that's not a helpful piece of information at all. Whereas they came up to you and said like, you know, fever plus tachycardia equals SERS criteria. Um, I'm, it, the urine, if, if you wrote a sentence, the urine's infected, this equals sepsis, right? And now they need to be admitted for IV antibiotics and all of a sudden it goes away. You knew that happened in your head, but anyway, we're deep, we're down a deep rabbit hole. So all that coaching stuff, we should probably be better at it, uh, Ethan. And they're really good at it in, in the private sector. I mean, it's what they do. Um, but like, but but again, back to priorities. You know, would it be great if we generate more revenue? Yeah, 
it would be great. And we should get serious about that. Have the last three years been a really good opportunity for us to get serious about that? Not so much, right? Like it has been an opportunity to like convince most of you not to go like to sell like Botox injections on the street because uh, the emergency department is a, is a, you know, is a difficult place to be. Um, and instead to sort of double down on the fact that like we have an amazing, amazing privilege of being affiliated with this beautiful, wonderful medical school, this extraordinary, these extraordinary residencies, right? And the and, and the nurses and PAs that we work with side by side. It, I mean, you know, it it is energizing when we're not dying from some, you know, surge of COVID patients or a crisis of the day. So what do we do about that other side of things? You know, how do you incentivize that? And I went, I actually. You know, so I've been, you know, I've been in a couple of different places where they have a, a where I've had a lot of different ways that people wanted to incentivize this. Uh, and they just, and it's just, you know, there's no right, there's no wrong. Instead of sending, showing you a million different, um, instead of showing you a million different examples, I'll just sort of pull up what I've shared with some of you, which is like where we are right now for what we're going to do um, for this year. So I just talked to you about the clinical, right? The, uh, and th this is a, this blends, uh, RVUs blends sort of how how you bill, you know, with how many patients you see, and hopefully sort of levels the playing field a little bit. Um, and uh, and patient experience is something that I think is a priority. And like this, you know, it used to be sort of how often someone looks at your charts and says you're a terrible documenter. You could have gotten a level higher, and you got a level lower. Um, but for reasons not worth sort of talking about, we went with a lower bar which is let's just walk before we run and let's get the charts closed so that they're in the revenue cycle in time. There's also sort of a patient safety piece there. If you don't, you know, if, if the people don't know what you were thinking when you put them in the hospital or when they have a return visit, that's that's not ideal. So better to close these things in 72 hours. This, this is about, this is like the gentlest clinical metrics, I think that um, you're gonna find anywhere. This is really just a nudge. This is This is step one. Um, pause for a second, because the other piece over here is important, and we can either talk about it now or later, which is who are you? How do you spend your time? If you're a 50% researcher, you know, you don't, you see that there's not a research track here. You're a 50% researcher. Don't tell anybody, but I care so little about your RVUs, and I care so much more about the fact that you're submitting grants and that and that more than submitting them that you're getting them you know we don't do that here this is this is an old thing from my old life oh no did i oh yeah criterion one so performance expectation on papers submit to um for the expectation to get any incentive you need to submit three to get 125 to get 104 uh, sorry 150 you need to submit four they need to be in a top journal this needs to be in a, accepted in a journal with an impact factor greater than 10, right? Step to the next thing. The expectation for grant submissions is that you're covering your salary, right? Over here, you know, you have to have at least one R01 or R01 equivalent and you need the PI, you need to or foundation over here, you know, two R01s. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, like the, this, this is sort of a very detailed world. And then, you know, if you're a teacher, you know, well, that's not the point that I was making, teaching ratings. And departmental service like these are examples of old systems that i was a part of and you just knew if you didn't submit a third r01 that year you weren't getting you know 100 percent of your bonus right you take that back to here right and <laughs> will we someday have a research column here maybe right but like that was not sort of step one as we try to sort of dust off all our minds about how it should happen but we use these instead if you're these percentage breakdowns if you're a core faculty and you're really sort of central to the residency you know, your academic stuff, your residency stuff counts a little more than if you're academic faculty, that you're not sort of central to the residency. And certainly if you're in the community practicing clinical medicine, this isn't a metric for you. This doesn't make sense. You're much more, you know, you're much, it's, it's mostly about your clinical performance. Anyway, so it's, again, it's about the behaviors that we're trying to drive. So let's, let's just sort of stick with these, these, these pieces. So on the clinical side, that's where it was. On the academic side, we needed some, again, relatively low bar metrics. What's important for academics? Well, like if you're part of a, you know, if you're at a, at a teaching place and we're not filling out the evaluation of our residents, 
and we're not doing well in the eyes of the residents that are evaluating us. So this is us evaluating them and them evaluating us. Well, that's, you know, we're probably not meeting the mail. So this is literally, this is fill them out. You know, the someday Duncan, I'm sure, will be on us about sort of the richness and the specificity of our feedback. And of course, he's right about that, and, you know, um, but right now it is fill them out. And here, these faculty evaluations, you guys used to do at 360 in Uptown. You didn't do it downtown. I don't think they did it West Side. Um, there's a lot of other information that comes to us from the faculty. I, I get have the pleasure of reading all the student mistreatment reports that come from the medical school about sort of what faculty have done to students that are um, that is considered mistreatment. You know, we have you know HR claims. All those things go into faculty evaluations. Um, th this this one is one of the least perfect ones for us right now because um, it's hard to like get nursing and PA assessment of of faculty. It's easier to get resident assessment of us. And then what does this even mean? Academic productivity. You know, we need something here. Why is it why is it fair? that Ethan, I want to keep picking on you because you have your camera on, that Ethan wrote 10 papers last year and submitted four grants and got two giant ones. And um, Brendan uh, who did, wrote one paper last year, submitted zero grants. Like, why is it fair, right? Or, or maybe that's a bad example. Let's take two core faculty members, both of them deeply committed to education, and one of them wrote five abstracts, belongs to six different national committees, speaks routinely about performance evaluation and curriculum development, and the other one does nothing, right? So how do you sort of, how do you incentivize them to write an abstract, join a committee, go do a thing um, at SAM or at CORD or at ASAP? You know, I guess I would say, you know, some of that is you just sort of begin with some sort of inventorying of what people do. Just tell us, tell us what you do um, and we'll get to sort of, and that's gotta get turned into, you know, some sort of capture and stratification, but for starters, just tell us. And my goal here is that this all gets baked into a tableau, just like you saw, so that instead of looking at, instead of looking at press gainy variability, you're looking at academic productivity variability and no different than I told you for RVUs here, Right, that we're we pull out this cluster of people that are kids, right? These are PEM doctors, and 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 base PEM performance around PEM performance. We pull out, you know, on this, you know, on the academic productivity. We're going to pull out different cohorts of folks because my example that I used was a bad one because I chose Ethan, who spends a lot more time focused on research, uh, um, uh, versus someone who has an administrative role or an education role or as a clinician. Brings us sort of back to if I'm if I'm practicing at Queens and I'm a pure clinician, right? My academic productivity is that's, that's not a thing. No one told me I didn't take a job that says write abstracts and you know go sort of give national grant rounds and write grants. Anyway, I'll pause saying that like hopefully I've beaten that to death because the other stuff is sort of like chip shoddy. Right, citizenship. You belong to a department. You got to do some stuff, right? We're going to set a threshold. You got to go to faculty meeting because you're disconnected from what's happening in faculty meeting. You're disconnected from ops. You don't know the people. We're hiring new folks. We're showing you new faces. We're doing initiatives that someone on our faculty meeting this morning called it like forced wellness or something like that. Is that you, Grossman? Is he on here? Um, anyway, you know, like yeah, there's a there's a there's a the, the wellness people came and they're giving us some pointers about sort of X, Y, and Z. Um, there's a curriculum, there's stuff being put together, and it's important to be there. We built a really, really nice grant, rebuilt a really nice grand round series after COVID decimated all muscle memory that we had. So twice I'm talking about the east side, uh, and I'm sorry that I'm doing that. I mean, I very I try really hard to um, to sort of make sure that I'm inclusive of everybody, but this this grid that I'm showing you right now is is about is about the east side. So the grand rounds, uh, was lecture series that got built for uh, the East Side is twice a month. The guy that was there today was extraordinary, right? He's like a world authority on space medicine. He's an emergency physician. He's got a PhD in, um, in some sort of like aeronautical engineering or something like that. He works for NASA. He's brilliant, right? He's at the cutting edge. And we bring folks in to, to educate and to network and yada, yada, yada. 
and I want faculty there in addition to residents. And Laura, thanks for putting your thing on, but I'll grab you in one second. And then departmental participation, no different than um, academic productivity. Like we just gotta, we gotta inventory it. We gotta know what you're up to. And I, and look, this, these are wrong. I'm happy to say they're wrong. I'm showing them to people. Um, we're I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna use them gently. Uh, and if you are running a program for your local high school, or if you are sort of mentoring for residents through their scholarly project, or if you're working on, you know, QI initiatives in the department, on a hospital committee, on a med school committee, yada, yada, yada. The others are there because I want people to write it in because it's much more important to me that they're carving out something that's important to them that they want to do um, that's going to develop their career uh, than it is what they're actually doing. So I'll pause there at the end of citizenship, Lara, and please jump in. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask um, to that last point, how do we write it in and how is this like information spread so that it's, you know, it's something that we know about it, it's accessible because it's really helpful for us to see this here. Um, that's question one. Question two is just like very basic. Uh, what is what is the breakdown and difference uh, between core versus non-core versus clinical? What are these different roles? Yeah. So like is, is clinical just like at the community sites? I, I think there's just some confusion around that. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, you know, we need to align our tracks. I mean, frankly, right. Like, so we have, ideally this would be track-based and role-based in, in my mind. Right. I mean, so core faculty are designated as a part of the residency. So, you know, for downtown, you should know, I think, you know, if you're core faculty or not in the Upper East Side, I think we know, and I'm pretty sure on the West Side, they know, and on Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island and Rumsey or, in, uh, you know, or South Nassau, I don't know if they're on here, but they know that they're not. Um, academic faculty, which is essentially you're at an academic site and you're a non-core faculty member, that you're probably on the clinician educator track, um, but you, your, your, your principal, you know, and Andy can sort of speak to this, he has watched this track evolve and was on the, the committee that just released new recommendations for January 2023 about what that's going to look like. So um, here you could be anywhere, but you're much more likely to be at an academic place, but not be central to the residency. And then the practice track, the clinical folks. So, you know, that's the, the Queens faculty and the Brooklyn faculty, almost without exception, I think, well, with a very few exceptions, um, are our practice track. They're they're seeing patients in the community and they're they're not educators and researchers. I, does that answer it? And Andy, did you want to jump in? No, I, I it, it's great. I the one thing I, I wanted to say, it, it's a little bit historic the way that uh, the the staffing, the model. Uh, for reimbursement is, is changing, and and that's a, a big credit to you because it's it's uh, just been a long battle trying to get the dean to understand uh, our practice. So this this is this is great. Uh, that said, the the dean and the hospital president will always look at our budget, and so uh, um, it it is something even for the researchers. Even though Brendan said he really doesn't care about the clinical side. I have to say, if your work RVUs per hour are five instead of seven, that's a really big red flag. And I, I do think that's a ding. And so I have to say across the board, on the whole, almost all the faculty, no matter who you are, are about seven work RVUs per hour, unless that's changed dramatically. Oh. There are some high performers and they will always get Brendan's credit, uh, 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 notice, who are getting nine and even 10 work RVUs per hour. What are they doing right? This is Andy Jagoda right here, guys. Just yeah. I, I don't mean to out him, but here you go. He's at 22. Yeah, right. And, but there are some other people who are down like at four work RVUs per hour. And that's a really big red flag. So back to Ethan's question, uh, there is a point where, where a group, because we're a group, has to look at the low performers. Uh, nobody makes budget, by the way. And it's only uh, Brendan's cleverness of getting funding uh, that keeps us whole, and but everyone really does need to to pull their weight, I think. So, yeah, for sure. But you know, but you know that meaning as well as I know that meaning, right? We we could have a hundred and thirty million dollar budget, and Dennis wants to look at the seven million dollars that is research funding for eighty percent of that meeting, right? The CFO, oh. yeah, the 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 hundred meetings before that, uh, where the CFO says, "I don't care about research. Show me your clinical." budget and your clinical metrics right like is a very different meaning we we have so many different masters yeah um but but i but the, but, the, but we shouldn't lose in that that the reason 
the reason we're tracking this. Sorry, the, Laura, the other question you asked was, how are you going to, how are you going to know this? Yeah. And I, and I sort of said, like, ideally, you're going to get a red cap instead of a Word document that's going to make it easier for you to fill in what you did, right? So that these grids then end up looking like, um, you know, number of abstracts this year, number of regional talks, number of national talks, number of, uh, you, you know, participation in uh in uh, in in hospital or or school committees or maybe not maybe we leave it dumbed down for the first year and we just have an academic work table you know and we sort of strat out the people that we stratify you by uh sorry that's not what i was looking for we stratify you by what you're doing right what's the core faculty academic productivity look like versus the sort of the people that are at an academic site but are not central to the residency or not core to the residency uh versus the versus the clinical folks Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, ideally that you get two, you get two tableaus, the clinical one plus the academic one. I love the idea of the red cap because people are doing so many creative things. That's cool. Yeah. And we need to make it easy. You know, like the, uh, yeah, the this, I mean, this is, this is what I used to fill out, right? This was, this is, this is old sort of, but like I used to, you know, you count this and write your goals. Same deal, right? Presentations, national, international, regional grants what are you active on i mean you know everybody's got some version of this this is uh this is a clinical one from a from a different place where there was this you know the sort of uh hybrid versus group versus individual you know sometimes it's about you you know from when you were working an intake shift what proportion did you discharge what proportion did you send to fast track what were your dispos per hour Right. We really were trying really hard back in the day to sort of make sure that we did ambulatory referrals out of the emergency department. Right. So for each new patient, we created incentive around this. Again, chart completion within 72 hours and teaching this. You know, this is uh, this was based on a score that, you know, that the, that the residency leadership would bring to us at the end. Just examples of different ways that people have done it. And, you know, our, what we're what I think we should we're doing, what we're going to do for next year. It's really low bar stuff. I think, you know, close your charts, go to some proportion of grand rounds. And there's gonna, and I should say, if I haven't said already, I keep talking about this uh, as, you know, sort of the, as Uptown, because there is a grid that looks very similar to this, almost the same, but it doesn't translate perfectly to every site. So you need to, you need to hear this from, from your people. Um, but this was created, the template was created by the enterprise. And it will be customized to sort of the to your local site. Anyway, and then down here, right? There's some site-based stuff. It used to be transfers, but that because at MSH, that's a huge deal. We got to transfer them out. Um, but for reasons, you know, we built a whole shift of PAs that do that now, so it's less about the doctors. Just like provider, just like time, door to doc time went away because we put a provider in triage. Um, so we need to make sure that we are appropriately responding to our sepsis alerts. We got in trouble at Mount Sinai Heart because of the heart score documentation. Yada yada yada. So these are site-based. This is a group metric where this is about um again, we need to set a threshold. 95% of the time the sepsis alert is addressed, or 95% of the time the heart score is documented in a patient that's going to go up to, you know, um, that qualifies to have a heart score documented from outside of heart. And then they need to go on a grid. Um, and we need to decide what thresholds are. Right? How many standard deviations? And so, like, some of these are probably more forgiving than uh, Dr. J would be. You know, he would say that this should be one standard deviation for our views, right? Not two standard deviations. Because when you look at it, at two standard deviations, that's what one, two people that are below and one, two people that are above. Is that really an incentive? Well, I don't know. I don't know. We need to look at what the data looks like. Um, what do we do for academic productivity, right? Are we doing 25th and 75th? This piece is not written in stone. They should say draft over the top of it because the truth is for the first year that we roll something like this out, I think we need to be flexible. You know, you guys have all, many of you have heard versions of this from your local sites. I mean, the West side is pretty regimented about this. I think, I think uh, frankly, downtown, it's been hard because all the data came from an EMR that got, um, retired in the middle of a pandemic, right? And those data feeds don't sort of really exist yet uh, for Epic. Anyway, so I've not been tracking the chat. I'm rambling on. 
Ah, thanks. So you guys were uh, translating for me. So, you know, I mean, that's uh, the, the gist in my mind is that, you know, maybe I'll say one other thing, which is there is, I just stopped sharing, didn't I? So, that, so there is also a piece that comes out from the dean's office that they launch every year, which is this, you know, the faculty performance evaluation. Um, and on here is scholarship, teaching, research, clinical, service, professionalism, citizenship, all sort of, and then, and then with this comes wonderful instructions that say, that say like, almost nobody should be getting threes. Right, so this made everybody very angry with me. Um, I'll tell you what, I got here, it was my first year, a pandemic happened uh, and we didn't all die. And he was like, okay, solid three, good job. And I was like, really, I can't have like a, can't have like a four? And he was like, no, four. He's like, you know, if I give you a four, I got to give everybody a four. Anyway, so like, I, you know, I know this, this upsets folks. And, you know, we looked at the distribution by site. Some sites are fours and five kind of sites because everybody's um, extraordinary there. Some sites are sort of three kind of sites. We need to rein that in, right? Because it's not fair for what we're doing to, to you to sort of set, make some of you feel good about yourselves and others feel bad about yourselves. But the punchline is that the dean wants this too, because both the dean and us as the department are trying really hard to make sure that we're getting you to a place where you get promoted. These aren't just nudges for no reason, right? But like you join a national committee, they're going to assign you something to do. You're going to get networked and meet some people. You go to Grand Rounds, you know, you meet this guy that does space medicine. You hear his talk, you have, you know, coffee and bagel with him beforehand. And, you know, next thing you know, I mean, in fact, he's reaching out to Andy uh, tonight because I talked to him today. And he's very interested in how they can become run an advisory service for all these private sector space companies that are now sort of starting up. Right. This is anyway. So like, this is how you do it. This is how you get promoted. This is how you develop your career by the by us. Sadly, some people will just do it on their own. But by us saying explicitly to you, join a committee, go to the meeting, sit there, be the junior person who they then say, hey, would you mind doing this task? And you say, I would mind a little bit, but like it'll also be fun to get to know you and I'll, and I'll do stuff with my life. Anyway. And you tell me, is that sort of where your head was on what this looks like? Some balance of brutal finances um, and sort of accountability and also nurturing, loving development of people's careers. No, I think this is great. I, I, this is uh, uh, the framework and for uh, everybody, I think it's very helpful to see on paper uh, just how we are looked at and it helps us prepare. So it's January now, everyone has 11 months until they're going to meet again. And it's very clear exactly what are the things that you're going to look at with them to look at performance. Yeah, this this faculty meeting this morning, we would have, well, I've tried to walk through at the end of the year with most people uptown, what their metrics would look like. Um, and we at faculty meeting this morning, we would have gone over uh, uptown. We would have gone over it again. I don't know if you guys know or not, but things are a little bit complicated uptown right now. So we did not sort of trouble everybody with that. We instead talked about whether or not we will have any nurses on the overnight tonight. Um, so, but we'll get there. I think people have a good sense of what's happening uptown. I think the rollout on the west side is okay. Um, I think uh, Ugo has always been pretty clear. Um, I know the least about where, frankly, where Deb and, and Abed are on, on on rolling this out and sort of giving clarity to folks. I don't know if they're on. And I um, and we don't, Ramsey and South Nassau sort of do their, have their own structure still. Um, we're, we're helping them to the extent that they want to sort of be folded in. It's tricky, you know, they have different EMRs. We do a lot of data EMR pools, but we're meeting with them and trying to, there's a bit, you know, if you don't have residencies, um, it's a little bit more clear, clean, clear cut. They have the old Envision ones, you know, like I think, is anybody from Rumsey here? I think in, in Jonathan's mind, the, you know, the Envision metrics of sort of imaging and throughput times and all these things are the kinds of things that he's tracking and he knows how to track them in their electronic medical record. And they, by the way, like the other piece to say out loud here is like we, we can't be tone deaf about what's happening. You know, I'm talking about Rumsey right now. Rumsey, they all worked for Envision. About half of them stayed and moved over to work for us. We brought in new folks there. They've had a lot of change in their life. 
beating on them about like cross-sectional imaging rates this year and throughput times this year. By the way, next week they move to a brand new emergency department. They move out of one and into another. Like this is not the time to be to be doing that. Like, this is the time to be making sure that your faculty feels supported. Um, and I would say the same thing about us. I think that this is a, we are I, we are intentionally sort of creating metrics that can be met. Um, and we did, and we intentionally didn't sort of create a separate set for uh, the people who are doing special pathways. You know, special research folks. At some point, we need to figure Definitely. out. If you, if, at some point, we need to figure it out. We, and we need to be careful about carving out people that should be carved out. When I sent this out to, or when I walked through this with Chris Struther, um, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like things need, what's core if you're peds, by the way? It's a real question. Are we core to the fellowship or did you mean core to the residency? There's a pin in that one for us to figure it out, right? But the RVUs are a real thing. He yeah. said, are you going to oh, separate that out separately for peds? So, I mean, I was just going to say, Brendan, that we, um, we, you know, we showed the tableau. Um, I showed the tableau to, you know, the providers, but um, it's really just, it's the first time they're really seeing, you know, the changes to it. And I think just having people look at it and ask those questions, I think is important so we can, you know, fine tune and, and continue to make it exactly what it needs to be. Yeah, Deb, thanks. And your tableau looks different than the one that I showed, right? I mean, a couple of your of the fields are different, number one. And yeah. then, but, but I think it's important like to uh, for everybody to know that the conversations we're having together are about how we build a faculty that never, ever want to leave and only want to sort of deliver extraordinary care to these um, to these people that trust us with their lives. Um, and that sort of and that and that, and that if, if, it, if it means we walk a little bit slower. Okay, we walk a little bit slower. That's a culture that I would that, that I'm super happy to be a part of. And I and I don't mean just me, the, the leadership structure, all the people at the sites that are driving these. And listen, at the end of the day, I don't have to be the bad guy if you're not doing stuff to get promoted because Andy still does that. He calls you and says, What's wrong with you? It's your eight. Why aren't you world famous yet? You should be a, a full professor. Um, and uh, and I get to be the good guy. You're always the good guy. Yeah, right. I, should, I, I should say to everyone's credit, despite COVID, the innovation in our department over the last uh, uh, two and a half, three years, the number of publications and the national committee work uh, is, is really impressive. And so even though we've gone through a really tough time of transition uh, with COVID, et cetera, uh, everyone's been amazingly productive. And so that's uh, that's pretty exciting if that can be done during COVID. I, I, I can't even imagine what's ahead of us in the next couple of years. Yeah, we expect a fourfold increase, I think is what I mean. <laughs> whatever. So it's true. Yeah. I, you know, I've said before, and I'll, I'll sort of say again that, you know, the first couple of years of sort of end of year assessments with people were tough. I mean, people were people were were broken. Um, most of them got done right before the strike. And when I've met with people this year, you know, Upper East Side and MSH folks um, for their end of year evaluation, I, like you can feel it coming back. Like yeah. all the stuff that made them tick and made them want to be at a big academic place and do stuff, it's back, you know? And that is like a breath of fresh air. It's exciting to talk to folks who are excited about their careers. All right, well, we're just about out of time. If there's any uh, a question that, hasn't been asked, now it's a good time to ask Brendan. You, you have him for a couple more minutes. And while you're thinking of your question, I'll just remind everyone, next month, February, second Wednesday, uh, we are going to present the new uh, criteria for appointments and promotion. Uh, Rena Carini from uh, 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 the Dean's office will be presenting and we'll kind of go over uh, all the uh, criteria for appointment at the different levels. And we'll talk about practice track and uh, we're gonna sprinkle it in with a little bit of IME, the Institute for Medical Education. Uh, it's really gonna be a good session and very valuable for, for everyone. So I, I hope you can join us. All these uh, lectures or presentations, they're not lectures, are uh, um, captured and on video. So we now have a library of, I don't know, 14 
different faculty development presentations. 